Boom shakalaka. Awesome. Well, here we go, guys. This is um, our eighth week in this series that we're calling The Interrupters, and we've actually covered um, all 12 apostles, um, and we're covering uh, Paul as the 13th. Last week, we studied um, Barnabas, who is actually considered an apostle. We also covered um, the first deacon and the first martyr, uh, which was uh, Stephen. Hey, look at Look at that good-looking guy. All right. Awesome, awesome, awesome. The, too much Darren, a little less of Darren. Let's, let's put Paul up there. Boom. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, yeah, you guys, this is going to kind of wrap up the first part of our, of our series. Um, yeah, you won't want to miss next week, Night of Worship, right, the following week. Um, Robert Hoskins is going to be doing a special Sunday night here, and he's actually going to be going, doing a deep dive on Sunday night of his book, um, Overcoming the Battle of the Mind, the Will, and the Emotions. So he's going to be um, doing a deep dive into that book, which is kind of fun um, on that Sunday night. Um, when I get back, um, I'm not going to be doing any series. When I come back, I'm just going to be telling stories uh, in, all, in, all three, in all three services, talking about just uh, what we saw Jesus do um, over in, um, uh, on the border there of Romania and um, Ukraine. Pretty amazing, guys. We've had a lot of favor. Had a meeting on um, Friday morning with, uh, with uh, a spirit-filled revivalist editor at USA Today. Um, yeah. And in fact, her boss, the executive, whatever her title is, is also a believer. So there's actually incredible born-again believers in the media. And, um, and, the, uh, and this project has already been greenlit from the executive chief, whatever, of USA Today. So they're, they're very excited because we're taking uh, Troy Brewer's videographer and photographer, uh, Giles Hooper, with us. And they're excited because the, the press, they get all of their photos from the same buckets. And so they borrow, they borrow these, you know, so they, there's a lot of the same photos that are used for their various stories. So they're really excited um, to be able to get um, uh, some very unique photography. Now, Giles, when he was a little boy, he saw the cover of Life magazine and saw like this war zone. And it's always been a dream of his to be a wartime photographer. And so when they were on the call and said, hey, would it be all right if we sent over a contract um, so that we could be able to use your photographs. This is like a dream come true um, for him. Um, but it's also pretty amazing because they want to get uh, our perspective because it's interesting. I mean, e- even, uh, even reporters know that a lot of the news that's being reported isn't necessarily true. And so um, they're actually excited to be able to work with our team to get stories really from the front line, stories from these refugees as they're pouring into um, Romania. And then not just that, but whenever we've had the opportunity of going into these kind of situations, I always go in one way and I come out another way. I always go in with one kind of perspective and then I come back with a different kind of perspective. So I'm looking forward to coming back a changed person. Um, and I look forward to coming back and just sharing with you what we saw uh, Jesus do there um, in that country. This is what I know for a fact the Holy Spirit be hovering all up in that mess. Holy Spirit is hovering all up in it. And I know that Jesus is doing stuff there. And I cannot wait to partner with what the Spirit is already doing there. So we don't have, we don't have any we're, we're presumption into thinking that we're bringing Holy Spirit. I know Holy Ghost be hovering all up in that tohu vavohu. And I believe that we're going to get to partner with Him and declare, let there be light. Let there, let there be light. Yeah, we also need to be praying. This thing, I smell rats with this whole mess that's happening over. Uh, Russia has very little of their army actually in there. This, this thing is some sort of setup. This, this thing is some sort of trap. We, we, we have to be praying that, that there is light. Let there be light. That God would expose the agenda of, of evil, evil, tyrannical in uh, kings that are partnering with a spirit of insanity, we need to pray for great wisdom uh, because there's, there's something not, not right. And if, uh, if for some reason um, we go in with our country or, or any of the countries that are part of NATO, um, uh, the, 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 it, 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 it won't be good, right? And so it's not that we're inf- afraid of Putin, but 
um, there's some crazy stuff going on. It, it looks like a trap has been set. We have to pray. We have to pray. We, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Lord is, I know we are praying. I know God is hearing our prayers. But, but let's pray in the heavens and let's believe that as we join with our high priest, King Jesus, um, in heavenly places, that his kingdom will come and he will do what only he can do. And that, that's what we need to see is um, we, need, we need to see the batteries taken out of this demonic um, uh, uh, agenda that is, taking, that is taking place. And speaking of demonic agendas, tonight we're going to be looking at, um, at a man who thought that he knew God, that he understood God, and yet he was actually partnering with a very subversive demonic agenda. Whoever thought that you could think that you knew God, understood God, but instead you were actually working with an antichrist spirit. How do you know that the spirit of religion, okay, is, is almost synonymous, believe it or not, with an antichrist spirit, with an anti-anointing, an anti-intimacy, an anti-relation. Why? Because what it wants to do is the spirit of religion wants to replace relationship with policy and formula. Okay? To inoculate you with just enough knowledge so that you are incapable of being spirit-led. And to the degree that we are enticed by formula and tradition, to this degree, we nullify the power of God in our midst and in our generation. So you have to have the courage in this hour to be an interrupter and to break the script and to never apologize when the Holy Spirit shows up. To never apologize if you just begin weeping in front of your friends, in front of your family, in front of your co- or if you begin shaking violently underneath the presence. Don't apologize for that. Own it. Own this presence of God. Let Him come. Let Him show up. and Let Him have His way. Let Him so possess you. Let Him shake you. Let him speak through you. Never apologize for the Lord showing up and making a fool out of you. That's what we need. We're going to need a generation that that just says, so come and possess me. So come and burn in me. And I'm telling you that when God begins to move in any sort of generation, whether it was the 90s or the early 1900s, okay, it's not the spirit of the world that rises up against it. It's the spirit of a religious church that always comes to shut down a move of God. It's the spirit of a religious church that comes to strangle a move of God and comes to turn revival into performance. What happens is is that when we turn revival into performance, it's a spirit of compromise. And that spirit of compromise comes initially in order to set about a program instead of uh, to build an audience for men instead of build an audience for God. When we begin to fear man more than we fear God, we open up a door not just to compromise in the areas of religious performance, but compromise is compromise. And when you open the door to compromise, the host of ugly minions come in with it. It's not just compromise in the, in the, in the context of, the, of methodology and how we do church services. When you, when you begin here, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, financial compromise follows and sexual compromise follows. And so for this reason, it is so important that we don't make being the sin police our primary objective, being a chief Pharisee, like the man we'll be looking at tonight. Where are the sin police? Where is your sin? You know. You know. <laughs> but that we make Christ Jesus, His face, His presence, the ultimate prize. That Christ Jesus, it is you who we love. We are not trying to measure up to a moral code by which the code will determine our level of success and holiness within the church. It, we are determined to love Jesus, love His people, love His church, serve Jesus, serve people, serve His church, that, the, that, that we will aim to fulfill the greatest commandment. Yeah, that we love the Lord our God with everything that we are, and then we love each other as we love ourselves. That's what holiness looks like. Holiness looks like you love Jesus and you love people. This is what holiness looks like. Good times. I feel like we could call it today. So today, tonight we're going to be talking about um, the Apostle Paul. 
he was the most influential leader in the early Christian church. And most of what we know about Paul comes from the Bible and the book of Acts, which is a lot. We know a lot about this guy. In fact, in my study, I had to like just keep simplifying. And simpl- At one point in time, I had 26 pages of notes for tonight. And I, I, and I whittled it down to 25 What do we know about Paul? We know that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Jew of Jew, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He came from a God-fearing family, right? Um, uh, uh, He was a Pharisee just like his dad. He was educated uh, by a respected, by a very well-known rabbi named Gamaliel. Uh, His Jewish credentials include his heritage, his discipline, and his zeal. In Philippians chapter 3, he explains... Why, um, if anybody had the, the belief that they were saved by their adherence to Judaism, it was him. This is what he says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. If any of you think that you're saved by your works, then I'm more saved than you. Because as good as you think you are, I'm gooder. Okay, he goes, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regards to the law, a Pharisee. And as for zeal, ha <laughs> a zealous son. He says, I persecuted the church. And as for righteousness based on the laws, I was 100% faultless. <laughs> Jeez, right? He goes on to say that he considers all of his righteousness as garbage, dung, el crapa. He says here, my identity used to be rooted in my Jewishness. He says, after spending much time wrestling with his identity in Jewishness, he says, my identity is now found in being a follower of Yeshua. He then begins spending the rest of his ministry dismantling this idea of justification through works, which he would tell the Galatians is witchcraft. We know that he was a Roman citizen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good times. He was a Roman citizen. Born in Tarsus, a prosperous city. Dude came from money. He had Roman citizenship, and this status gave him special privileges. In some cases, it even saved him from abuse. In Acts chapter 25, Paul was put on trial, and uh, his accusers asked him uh, uh, that they stand trial for Jerusalem, and they planned to ambush him and kill him. Paul leveraged his Roman citizenship and said, basically, I'm a citizen of Rome. I demand to see Caesar. Okay, and as a Roman citizen, he began to wait for this special meeting, and um, this is towards the end of the book of Acts. He's eventually put on house arrest. The book of Acts (laughs) comes to an end before we ever get to find out how that court case went. We'll talk about that here in a second. What was, what was it like? The book of Acts, I don't know if you've ever, you know, the book of Acts is like watching a movie where all of a sudden the power went out. (laughs) <laughs> that's like the book of Acts. You're like, why? oh wow, okay, I'm in. I, I, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, you know it, it, if it were a movie, it'd be longer than the new Batman. Like you're sitting there, you know, you're, imagine, why, imagine putting three hours into this film and all of a sudden power goes, goes out. <laughs> okay, everybody's going to need to go home. The power's out. You're like what happened at the end of the movie? That's the book of Acts. Awesome. Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21, Paul talks about citizenship. And he says, but our citizenship, okay? We shouldn't have pride in our citizenship as Americans. We're Americans. God, God's country, yeah? This is Paul. We're Romans. Romans, God's people. God's favorite, you know. We're, we're Jews. God's, God's people. We're Americans. He said, but our citizenship isn't of any place within this earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. 
And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enabled him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will become like his glorious body. He persecuted Christians. He being Saul, as a Pharisee, he was so passionate. He had a passionate and perfect hatred I would say for Christianity, Christianity isn't even a thing yet. There was this Jewish sect where there were these people and, and, and they had different nicknames and they were, they were followers of the way. Did, did, did you hear about that group? The group. They're growing. They're growing in numbers. They're followers of Yeshua. Followers of the way. And they were growing and this was really bumming him out. And so the idea was, they would persecute, they, they would kill these followers of the way in order to put an end to this movement. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2 says, Meanwhile, Saul, who was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, he went to the high priest and he asked for jurisdiction, authority and jurisdiction, so that if he finds anyone who belongs to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So, not a very nice guy, okay? Kind of a, a, a Christian, uh, kind of a terrorist to, to Christians. He'd strike terror in the hearts of believers in the way. But we do see that he gets radically wrecked by a revelation from Jesus and becomes a leader in the early Christian church. Puts his faith in Jesus, and as soon as he does, as passionate as he was about the religious ways of Judaism, he was that much more, and then some, passionate about preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul immediately begins preaching publicly, and he begins to get a reputation um, as a legit teacher. Throughout the rest of the book of Acts, Paul is a prominent figure who plays a pivotal role in bringing the gospel to the non-Jewish communities. He's called the, excuse me, he's called the apostle to the Gentiles. While Paul's status as a Pharisee is intense devotion to the law, we see that Paul begins breaking down the breakdowns and preaching a gospel of grace. We also see during this time that there's a lot of pushback from the Jewish Christian community, especially re regarding the area of circumcision. There's division because there's this idea that the newly converted Gentiles should be held to the same account as the newly, uh, uh, as the, uh, as the Jews. Uh, Galatians chapter 2 verses 6 to 9 says this, as for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God shows no favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised. Just as Peter has been entrusted to the circumcised, for God who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. How would you like to be known as the circumcised or the uncircumcised? Thank God we got new titles these days. J James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. They recognized the grace given to me, and they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. We see that Saul, okay, Saul, forward slash Paul, was a missionary, an outstanding missionary. We'll look at his journeys here in a second. Um, Paul established numerous churches throughout Europe and throughout Turkey and was typically um, driven towards regions where no one had ever been before. This is what good missionaries do. Where is there a place where nobody knows about 
Jesus? Where is there a place where the gospel hasn't been preached? This is the role of missionaries. Where are there people who don't know Jesus? Let's go and bring them Jesus. And then when they all know Jesus, we'll plant a church and then we'll go find another place. Now, here's the thing. If you call yourself a Christian tonight, and I believe that you do. Well, not me. Well, okay. You will soon. (laughs) When you give your life to Jesus, you become a missionary. Every Christian is called to be a missionary. The Great Commission is for every Christian. We are to go and make disciples of cities and nations. We are to make disciples of people. Amen? So we are either good missionaries or we're bad missionaries. And location does not determine whether or not you are a missionary. The soil that you are standing on does not determine your effectiveness in mission. If you can't lead people to Jesus in Seattle, you won't be able to lead people to Jesus in China. In fact, Seattle is the easiest place in the whole world to lead people to Jesus. Korea and Norway are tied for the most difficult places on earth to lead people to Jesus. And maybe there's other places. And the reason why I say this is because I've been to Korea. Man, that was difficult. We just <laughs> got to see some miracles and stuff. The only place that was more difficult than Korea was Norway. Oh my gosh, different night, okay? <laughs> Norway needs Jesus, for real. Okay. It was all like, Seattle, that's so hard. No, go to Norway. Okay. <laughs> if you're watching from Norway, yeah, God bless you. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Romans 15, 20 says, uh, I, I just, I just know. We're going to do some stuff in Norway. Okay, Romans fifteen twenty says this. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not. No, this is what Paul says. It has always been my ambition. I'm ambitious. I'm driven. I've always been driven to find people where Christ is not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Isn't that awesome? I'm driven. I am ambitious. Wouldn't it be awesome if the church of Jesus Christ today in America, in the northern, if we were ambitious to find places where there were no churches and we wanted to build churches from scratch, not not stealing people from other churches, not putting ads on KCMS. Are you looking for a better church than the church that you are at? (laughs) Have we got the church for you? Our music's better, our preaching's better, and our greeters are friendlier. Come to our church. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm telling you, there's a generation of interrupters that are so intoxicated with the new wine of the Spirit that we will preach to mockers, and the mockers will become believers, and the believers will become missionaries who change cities and nations. Paul, he was also a miracle worker, he was a supernaturalist. Yeah, wow, that's weird. No, it's not weird. All the apostles are supernaturalists. Every Christian in the New Testament was supernatural. The supernatural was not a luxury. This was not about being David Blaine. Let's see what we can make disappear. This was not about special effects or being extraordinary, just to be extraordinary. No, in the New Testament church... Being supernatural was not a luxury. It was a necessity if you wanted to live. I am telling you, we are not far off from having to dial in by God's grace the supernatural if we want to live. (laughs) And many of us have stories. Just to come to you right now, I'm called. Come on, I'm called. To work miracles. miracles. Can I tell you something? That's a lot of work. Working miracles is work. Sometimes they happen easily, and sometimes you have to work miracles. Different night. 
You've been called to be a miracle worker. You've been called to be a supernaturalist. Why? Because you've been called to be a son and daughter of the Most High God. He made a sorcerer go temporarily blind. He healed a man who had been lame since birth. He casted out a spirit that was starting to annoy him. (laughs) He healed people and cast out spirits that he touched. He resurrected a young man from the dead. He was bit by a venomous snake and nothing happened to him. He healed a man with a fever and dysentery. Those who saw and heard Paul, these miracles proved his authority, that he was from God, just as Jesus' miracles once demonstrated his. We need, just, we need to walk in signs, wonders, and miracles, okay? Amen. But not even so much for the person that's receiving the miracle. We need to walk in signs, wonders, and miracles so that we're convinced that we actually have authority from on high. Randy Clark says, don't you dare say that God isn't going to use you to walk in miracles until you've prayed for at least 100 people. Make a commitment to pray for 100 people for healing and then come and tell me that God doesn't heal. And then we see this incredible conversion story. It's the famous revelation of the Christ on the road to Damascus. This is one of the most remarkable aspects of Paul's life. As a young man, he was known for persecuting Christians. But by the end of his life, he endured significant persecution as a Christian. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so that if he found anyone belonging to the way, men or women, he could arrest them and take them to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. I said, suddenly a... Hey, Brandon, Brandon, is he there? Glenn, do you know how to do it? Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. He fell to the ground. (laughs) He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He replied, who are you, Lord? And then he heard, I am Jesus. At which point Saul said, beep. (laughs) The voice said, get up, go into the city, (laughs) and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there, not saying a word. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up, wow, from the ground. And when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see anything. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days, he was blind. And he did not eat or drink anything. This encounter with Jesus, okay, on the road to Damascus, changes everything. One encounter with Jesus will change everything. It will change the way you look at your past. It will change the way you're looking at the present. It will change the way you look at your family. It will change the way that you're looking at the future. It will change your theology. It will change your methodologies. It will change your preferences. One encounter with Jesus changes everything. 
How do we pray for people that are lost? How do we pray for people that are confused? How do we pray for people that are, that are full of rage? How do, we, how do we pray? We pray, Lord, just one encounter with you, that we are hearing stories from the Muslim nations about the, 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 the radical amounts of Muslims that are coming to know Jesus. Why? Because just like Saul was knocked off his, his, his horse, that we see Muslims that are going into visionary realms, that are going into dream realms, and Jesus is coming to... I got a good friend, and... and before he knew anybody, before he was anybody, he, he just decided to go to Indonesia. He just decided he was going to go. And he found a family that, that said that he could stay with him. It was a Muslim family. And that night when he went to bed, he remembers waking up in the middle of the night and he sees a bright light coming underneath the door to his room. And he hears his host having a conversation with someone. Okay? The next day, he comes out, and the, the, the Muslim family says, your friend came last night. He said, my friend? I don't have any friends. <laughs> right? They said, no, your friend came last night. He knocked on the door. He said, what was his name? He said, his name was Jesus, and he came in, and he ate with us, and he hung out with us. Tell us about your friend named Jesus. <laughs> Acts 9, verses 10 through 19. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. And the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he sees a man named Ananias. So he's already seeing you in a vision. Come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man. He's a bad, bad mama jamma. I have heard about all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. I like Ananias because he's like, God, just in case you have no idea who this guy is and what is going on, God, let me tell you something that you don't know. <laughs> but the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings. And to the people of Israel, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Hallelujah. So Ananias was obedient to the Lord, and he went to the house, and he entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit immediately. Something like scales fell off of Saul's eyes, and he could see again. And he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. All right. So here you have this real mean Jewish Pharisee, religious kind of jerk. And his name is Saul. And then... He has this encounter, he gets converted, now he's nice, and he gets a new name, Paul. <laughs> Saul, bad, okay? Paul, good. How many of you, this is how you've heard this talk? None of you, good. All right, this is a common misconception that Paul used to be Saul. There's no verse that says this. We see that Paul and Saul are actually two versions of the same name. Shortly after Saul converts and meets Jesus. Now remember, he's not a Jew that converts to Christianity. He is a Jew that remains Jewish and now is following Jesus. 
This is, this is, really, this is really important. Why? Because there is no Christianity yet. And this can become kind of like an anti-Jewish thought that you need to leave your Jewishness and become, right, an American Christian, right? Yeah. No, Saul did not leave his Jewishness to become a Christian. He became a Jewish follower of Yeshua. In fact, it's believed that even, he even would have had even a third name. So he had his Jewish name. He had his Gentile name, and it's possible that he even had a third name. His ministry is to the Gentiles. And when Christianity begins to emerge, it is oftentimes thought of a Jewish sect. It was a Jewish set of teachings and beliefs. But Christianity was radically different than Judaism And Paul becomes a master teacher, a builder within the church, an apologeticist for this movement of Christendom and becomes one of the most influential apologeticists ever. Not only that, but we see that the apostles affirm his revelation and his teaching. And we see him catapulted out of ARC, the Antioch Revival Center, ARC, on a series of radical missionary journeys. Here's the very first missionary journey. In fact, we did a a two-year study of the book of Acts once upon a time here, and we went through all of his missionary journeys. But you can see here, beginning in Antioch, goes into Cyprus, goes into Persia, Right, we see him going all the way into Antioch, Iconium. What's he doing? Planting churches. That one of the best ways that we can do missions is to plant churches. Find places where there's no community, where there's no ecclesia, where there's no called out ones. And we see that Paul goes from city to city planting churches. How does he do that? Being supernatural, doing miracles, casting out demons, preaching Jesus the Christ. This is his second missionary journey. We know that each of these missionary journeys would have taken well over a year. Okay? This is his third missionary journey. Okay? There was no Uber then. Okay? And it's believed that there was a fourth missionary journey that included Spain and Rome that's not actually included in the book of Acts. We also know that um, he didn't have very good luck when he traveled, okay? If you were ever getting onto a ship with Paul and you saw Paul getting on that ship, you'd want to get off that ship because most likely the ship is going to wreck, <laughs> In 2 Corinthians 11.25 says, Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Okay? That was with rocks. Okay? And, just saying. And three times. <laughs> just, we're in Seattle, so we've got to clarify. And three times I was shipwrecked. Three times. But not only that, but there is a fourth shipwreck that's recorded in Acts chapter 27. He was in four shipwrecks, and the Lord saved his life every time. Listen, the enemy wanted this guy dead. Satan did everything to take this guy out. In fact, there were not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six assassination attempts against his life. In Damascus, there was a plot to kill him. In Jerusalem, there was a plot to kill him, but they escaped. At Iconium, there was a plot to kill him. In Lystra, okay, that's what we talked about last week when they thought that Paul and Barnabas were gods and they called them Zeus and Hermes. First of all, they attempted to worship them and sacrifice to them. And then some Jews came and they convinced the same crowd to stone them. And they threw rocks and they thought that they had killed Paul outside the city gate. But he was still breathing. He was still 
a lot. Think about this. The very same crowd that was worshiping him one second was the very same crowd that thought they had killed him the next second. What does that remind you of? Jesus. The very same crowd that laid down palm branches and said, Hosanna, was the very same crowd that hours later said, crucify him. Listen. It is a waste of our time to live our lives for the praise of man. The very same people that will praise you one day will be the very same people who are blogging about you the next day. When somebody flatters you, you take that flattery and say, thank you very much. But then you go to the secret place and say, I ain't touching that glory. (laughs) I ain't touching that. Jesus, you and I both know. (laughs) If it's really dope and fly, it ain't me. <laughs> how do you love it when Jesus makes you look good? But how do you know that definitely won't, won't, wasn't you? <laughs> yeah, in Jerusalem, again, there was a plan uh, to, to, uh, to kill him. And then in uh, Caesarea, same thing years later, Paul was being held a prisoner. And um, Festus was in charge. Paul's accusers requested that Paul be brought back to Jerusalem. For they were preparing on his way back to Jerusalem to have an ambush to kill him along the way. Justin Abraham has a great teaching on the life of Paul where he goes through all of these times when he should have died. And basically, Justin teaches that he was, along with the rest of the apostles, unkillable. He teaches that even Jesus was unkillable. That when Jesus died, it was because at that moment on the cross, he said, I now surrender my spirit. He believes that whosoever would believe in him, okay, would be unkillable and that we could pass over at the time that we surrender our spirit. Four shipwrecks, okay, a a snake, a poisonous venomous viper that's hanging off of him, right? They thought they stoned him to death and he would stand up and say, bam, 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 bam. Can't touch this. We need to see signs, wonders, miracles, the supernatural power of God so we are convinced we are the sons and daughters of God. Because listen, you're not convinced yet. Neither am I. Your eyes haven't seen. Your ears haven't heard. Your crazy imagination is not perceived of the amazing things that God has in store for you. And yes, it will bring flourishing to the world, but it will also transform you. He wants to convince us we are his children. Paul gets arrested at the end of Acts. We already talked about this earlier. Paul appeals to Caesar. He says, don't you know who I am? I'm a Roman citizen. Bring me Caesar. I want to see him. And Acts 26 verse 32 says, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So it was like, I demand, let me see Caesar. You shouldn't have said that. What? We were going to let you go. But you annoyed us, and so now you are arrested. We see Paul goes on house arrest. He's got a little bracelet thing around his ankle. Okay, if he leaves the house, it sets off an alarm. No, before they had electronic devices on an ankle, they would just put a Roman guard in your home. That feels a little intrusive. Like, millennials would not like that. Like, taking selfies, and there's the Roman guard in the background. Like, can you stand over it? No? Okay. All right, cool. And this is how the book of Acts ends. <laughs> Acts 28, we see that he's on house arrest. But in 2 Timothy, we see that he appears as though at the end of his life, he's been released. Because we see two years um, bef- uh, uh, that he spends in, in Rome. All right. Let's land this thing. How many books of the Bible did Paul write? 13 books. 
And these were letters. It's, it's the letter of Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. We see that Paul's martyrdom is not recorded in the book of Acts. But church history would tell us that around 68 AD, under the reign of the emperor Nero, it is said that Peter was martyred and that he shared in a martyrdom similar to John the Baptist and that he was likewise beheaded. What's fascinating is that in 2002, archaeologists found a large marble sarcophagus near the location of Jerome. And it had Paulo Apostolo Mart written on it, meaning Paul Apostle Martyr written on it. And no one had ever opened this But using a probe, they used carbon dating. And archaeologists estimated that the remains inside were from the first or second century. The Vatican claims that these are indeed the remains of St. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. So here we have Paul, apostle, missionary, writer, martyr, who had a revelation of Jesus the Christ, who had a revelation of grace, who had a revelation that we are not saved through our works, nor are we saved by our adherence to the law, but we are saved by grace, through faith alone, in our Lord Jesus Christ. I, went, I once found myself, um, you, you guys can see me okay, yeah? I see. Then I'll come right in the shadow. <laughs> I once found myself uh, on Woodby Island, thanks. And I was, I was, this is back before I was pastoring. I was working for Comcast. They had me doing this, this thing out there. They were going to be launching some stuff. And I found myself eating dinner in this big grass courtyard area. And there were all these young people. And so um, I came over and just started up a conversation with them. All these young people were Jewish young people from Seattle. And they were over there for this, for this festival there in, in Woodby. And I don't know really how it came up. But I started talking to them about Jesus. Now, the second I mentioned Jesus, they looked at me like, oh, I get it. They, they immediately judged me. <laughs> they immediately had me figure figured out. And, and, and I, you don't have to be very discerning to realize when you just got put in a box. And then it began. I started having the most fun that I had ever had having this conversation with this big community of Jewish young people from Seattle about who Jesus was, about who his church really is, and the misconceptions that people have when they judge Christianity as this moralistic, works-based republicanism. People immediately think, you say, I'm a Christian, they immediately think you're a white evangelical who has boiled down your faith down not to the Nicene Creed but to ten tenets that were framed out by Bill O'Reilly and Tucker Carlson. (laughs) This thing's just a little deeper than that. This thing's just a little bit more legit. And can I tell you something? When I, when I was breaking down, when I was telling, this is what Christianity is. This is who Jesus is. You know what they told me? We have never heard this before. When I was in Capitol Hill and I had this guy and he was screaming at me in my face. Saying, if you're a real Christian, I, I want you to bless my gay marriage. I said, I can't bless your gay marriage. But I can bless you. 
This guy was in my face and I began to say that you're not saved because you're straight and you're not damned because you're gay. We've all sinned. And your sexual preference and getting that correct is not what will redeem you. That what gay people need is the same thing that straight people need. Salvation. Salvation by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And he said, why is no one? He said the very same thing that, that those Jewish young people said to me. Why have I never heard this before? Who else thinks this way? The guy in Capitol Hill said, You're just part, you, are, you are not like the rest of them. This is not what Christianity is. I said, this is what true Christianity is. I told, that, I told that, 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 that man that on the cross, Christ Jesus took on all of your homosexuality. He took on all of your sinfulness. He didn't like that because he didn't think that it was a sin or anything. And we sat there yelling at each other because sometimes that's what love looks like. And I sat there with these Jewish young people saying, you've been lied to. This is not what true Christianity, it is not adherence to laws and the ability to nail it he was nailed because of our inability to nail it and to crush it this is a huge part of what it means to be an interrupter it means that every single one of us we need to have the courage to interrupt the narrative that religion is framed because there is a generation that thinks that God hates them and doesn't love them and and doesn't have a place for them in heaven because they're evil, they're corrupt, they're dirty, they're whatever else. You guys, we have to learn to make some messes. We have to be willing to make some messes. We have to be willing to look stupid. We have to be willing to not have the answers. You know, I feel like all the time people ask me questions. I'm like, I don't know. I'll look into it. So many times because of the fear of not knowing, we just... We don't speak up. We're we're afraid to speak up. We're afraid to show up. We're afraid to love. We're afraid to engage, to to, to get in there. I'll tell you what happened. Right there in Capitol Hill, right there, standing on the rainbow crosswalk, that young man let me put my hand on his back. And I said, Father, I thank you that here is a son in whom you love. And I pray that he would know the Father's love. 20 minutes of fierce argument and debate, his hatred for the church because of one of his lovers that tried to kill himself because of conversion therapy. And this man let me put my hand on him and bless him with a fatherly blessing. This is what it means. This is what it means to interrupt religion's narrative and to bring forth this glorious good news of Jesus the Christ. Your job, my job, is just to say just enough. Just to move our fat lips and say just enough. Make just enough of a mess for Holy Spirit to hover in our tohu vavohu that we just created with, with with our lips. Our role is to say just enough for Holy Spirit to show up and reveal Jesus. And He will. And He will. And He will. Let's do it. You are salt. You are light. You are a city set on a hill. You are a revivalist. There is a third great awakening. You're sitting next to it. We're not waiting for Holy Spirit to come. Holy Spirit's here. The eyes of God are searching the globe, looking to and fro for a generation that will say, hey, me, God, me, God, me, God. Oh, I'm waiting for the day when when, when we see massive miracles in the church. We're seeing them every week. Tuesday nights, touch Yeshua. We're seeing miracles. We're seeing deliverance every single week. And it's from, it's from the people of God. It's from many of you guys that are here tonight. You're part of that ministry team. You see Jesus showing up. You see people getting healed. If He'll show up at Touch of Yeshua on Tuesday night, He'll show up in your neighborhood on Monday morning. He'll show up at your work on Wednesday afternoon. He, he will show up. 
Your God will show up. If you invite Him, He will show up. He will come in power when you call on His name. He will show up. You little apostle you. You little sent one you. You little prophet you. I can just see you now. Thus saith the Lord your God. The Lord would say to you today. I'm telling you, there's, a, a, there's an anointing for souls right now. The, uh, there is an anointing for souls right now. How many of you, you've been feeling it? Even the last two weeks as you're out and about, the Lord's highlighting people to you. And you find yourself, I, I, I just interpreted the tattoos on a, on a gal's arm in a restaurant from her wrist all the way up to, she's, it was awesome. With tears in her eyes. As the Lord gave a prophetic interpretation for the tattoos on her arm. Yeah. I should read your tattoos. Come on. No, <laughs> come on. Come on. Come on. Listen. I'm nobody. I'm nobody. You can do this. We can do this. Let's make some messes. Uh, you're probably not going to get arrested. What's the worst that can happen? You get banned from Facebook for like 24 hours or something. You know what I'm saying? What's the worst that can happen? Will you stand up to your feet? Let's pray for boldness tonight. Let's pray that the boldness of the lion of the tribe of Judah, let's pray for fresh fire to come tonight. Just stretch out your hands. Just say, Jesus, give me fresh fire for souls. Give me a fresh fire for harvest. Give me a fresh fire for miracles, for signs and wonders. With these hands, I will open the eyes of the blind. With these hands, I will, I will see the mute sing for joy. With these hands, I will see the dead reanimated and come back to life. Holy Spirit, we welcome your fire. <laughs> come on, just welcome his fire right now. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, fall. Fire, fall. Winds blow. Rain fall. Rain fall. Heck ha 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 ha. <laughs> Fire come. Fire come. Fresh baptism, King Jesus. Whoa, a fresh baptism right now, King Jesus. Whoa, fresh baptism. Yep, 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 yep. There it is. Yep, 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 yep. Hey, 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 hey. Fire. 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 Whoa. Shing ding boing. Hey. Whoa. Fire. 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 My God, my high joy, my delight, my God, my joy, my delight. Where you go, I'll go, what you say, I'll say, what you pray, I'll pray. What you pray, I'll pray. Where you go, I'll go. Where you go, I'll go. What you say, I'll say, God. What you pray, I'll pray. What you pray, I'll pray. Oh, where you go, I'll go. What you say, I'll say, God. What you pray, I'll pray. What you pray, I pray.
That's good. Come on, come on, come on, come on. name. I declare fresh revelation of authority. Hey, hey, ha, ha, right now, right now, in Jesus' name, fresh revelation of your authority right now. Fire burn, fire burn, fire burn, fire burn, burn. right now, right now, right now, right now, come, 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 come. Come, come King Jesus, come King Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, 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 inside of me, come be the fire upon my heart, come be the fire inside of me, yeah, yeah. Yeah, ignite, 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 ignite. Come, please. Oh. 
Yeah, burn like a fire, burn like a fire, burn like a fire. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. <laughs> Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Oh. Prophesy miracle workers, miracle workers, miracle workers, miracle workers, miracle workers, miracle workers, salvation preachers, signs, wonders, miracles, heavenly dreams, visions, trances, authority, authority, authority to cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead, freely have received, freely give. Freely you've received. Freely give. Freely you've received. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! You good? All right. Look at me. Repeat after me. Repeat this after me. Talk about it. Talk about it. Talk about it. Talk about, talk about what? Well, the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. You're not bragging about yourself. You're bragging and boasting about King Jesus. Whatever you see Jesus do through you, if Jesus did it, there's no such thing as a small miracle. Whatever Jesus does this week, I want you to talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. There's no expiration date on a testimony. If you don't see any miracles this week, I still want you to talk about the last miracles that you saw Jesus do. Go back to the last thing that you saw Jesus do and talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. it will open up a realm it will open up a realm and you will pick up where you left off and that's why I'm excited when we come back and we start studying the mystic saints and the desert fathers and we start honoring what Jesus did to these wild ones I am telling you a realm is going to open up we are going to step into some wild places why? Because we're going to honor the testimony of Jesus. It's going to open something up. It got, hey, listen, if you need prayer for anything, come on up. We'll have our prayer ministry team pray for you. Otherwise, God bless you. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Take care.